In the no man's land between Christmas and New Year, the magic rapidly dispels. It's clear to see why almost every culture in the world has a celebration of some sort in the middle of winter. Without it, the road to spring would look insurmountably long and treacherous. The decorations that cling to every wall like ivy start to look past their prime. The evergreens in the windows wilt under the weight of the tinsel and LEDs. The nights draw in at half past four, and offer little of the comfort they did before. The north wind lashes my face as I stagger against it. No snow, no ice, nothing glistens in the drudgery of our winter. Only trampled blades of grass in the churned up mud. The monochrome pebble dash of 70s bungalows set against a landscape of decay. The remnants of a bin bag woven into a hunchback tree. Underfoot, soft chalk is flecked with smooth worn flint. A carrying crow wheels overhead. The rolling hills, which in the summer are so picturesque, offer no shelter from the perpetual rain and sleet which whip horizontally inland from the sea. I look out across the darkening countryside to the distant harbour. Towering waves crash silently against its walls, scattering great plumes of sea foam into the sky. A lonesome ferry glides bravely out and towards the horizon. In a field by a copse, a weary-looking horse is wrapped in a tartan coat for the winter. An old man in a parka and corduroy trousers tosses bales of hay over the fence into its paddock. A child on a new Christmas bike wobbles down the hill. Salt-covered cars spray the barren roadsides with dark puddle water as they race towards their destinations. In the dead of night, the shipping forecast paints a bleak picture. Storm-force winds batter the remote headlands that circumnavigate this small island. In the pitch blackness, I roll over, glad for the warmth and shelter of my bed and think of the poor souls out there on the ships. I drift off to the sound of sailing by, only ever heard in semi-slumber, a lullaby to the lonely as the nation sleeps. Even later I lie awake and hear a ghost story, of smugglers who'd stormed a lighthouse and lured an unsuspecting ship onto the rocks and then ransacked it. All hands were lost, and when the authorities had arrived they'd found the place empty, the sturdy door left wide open to swing back and forth in the breeze, the beds made and unslept in, a cold plate of food left on the table with only a single bite taken from it, a bowl of slowly rotting fruit sat on the counter, a heavy coat left hanging by the door. The steel fork dropped on the floor was the only indication of a struggle, otherwise you may believe that the keeper had simply gone out and would return at any moment but he never did. No trace of him was ever found. Only, his successors would report strange noises at night, knocks at the front door, and footsteps coming up the spiral stairs. They wouldn't stay long, and eventually the lighthouse was abandoned. The dim patterns of moonlight on the walls shape themselves into strange figures of lighthouses ships and smugglers. I'm frightened. I lie awake staring at the door and waiting for the morning to come. Walking along the promenade the next day, the storm has passed over and the air is still. There are hundreds of people around as the gentle waves roll into the stony shore. An abandoned Art Deco hotel behind metal barriers, its outdoor swimming pool filled with rainwater and pebbles. Graffiti stains the once grand facade. 
Broken windows leave bare rooms exposed to the elements. I imagine what it must be like to explore the empty corridors, the foyer, the stairwells, to find hidden places where no one has set foot for years, perhaps decades. To find some souvenir of the past. A faded leaflet promoting visitor attractions now dilapidated. The photographs washed out like the cracked paint of their counterparts. Only vivid in old childhood memories. But children grow old eventually, and so too do the seaside resorts, as the youthful hope of summer holidays fades under the sheer weight of passing time, an eternal off-season of irrelevance and decay. Great metal shutters cover up the beach cafes, bathing huts and public toilets. I've lived here for twenty years and have never once seen them open. You can scarcely believe that there are rooms behind those barriers, hidden from all sights for so long, like ancient Egyptian tombs, yet so close to the gentle buzzing of dog walkers and mobility scooters. Perfect hiding places, where no one would ever think to look. My imagination runs wild as I think of what could be found there if anyone were to check. Along the cliff tops, there are fewer people. An empty churchyard. The smell of gorse bushes hangs in the sea-salted air. A pillar box of weathered concrete still stands sentinel amongst the weeds. Crushed lager tins in a pulp of rotting leaves pile up in the corners. Through the narrow window frame, a widescreen view of the open ocean, with only seagulls floating abreast its surface. Finally home, the hot water from the shower boils the frost from my bones. Clean clothes. Downstairs again and it's night once more. A miscellany of Christmas presents sit in piles on the living room table. The television shows an endless stream of repeats. Morecambe and Wise, Victoria Wood, one foot in the grave. A Christmas cracker crown lies crumpled in the corner. The wax from a burnt-out candle solidified on the neck of an empty wine bottle. Leftovers are served, and after dinner there is nothing much to do. There are no more traditions left to fall back upon. An old film, perhaps? A classic? A board game? Or a skim through the diffusion of terrestrial TV channels? Half an hour of customs officials questioning blurred-out junkies at Melbourne airports, punctuated by adverts for winter sales, tacky furniture and oak dining tables, holidays in the sun, model aircraft magazines for the over-fifties, and the domestic premiere of an old Australian detective show underscored by an obscure Motown song meant to evoke 50s nostalgia for an audience that's barely paying attention. Another day with the family. The novelty has worn off. It's New Year's Eve, the Sunday night of all festivities. Life can return to normal soon. Regular programming can resume. The tree can come down and the postman can go back to delivering bills. We watch Hootenanny and switch over in time for the increasingly lengthy firework display. 25 whole minutes this year. We get the picture. We wake up again. We eat breakfast. We wave goodbye to the relatives. We tidy. We think about the future for the first time. Of all the work to be done. Of plans. For Easter. For the new calendar year. Let's not pretend it'll be better than the last. Time doesn't box itself off into neat little compartments. There'll always be good times, and there'll always be bad. There'll always be remnants, and there'll always be fads. There's always despair, and there's always hope. There's always another summer, another spring, another autumn. There's always invention, and there's always decay. There's always storms and halcyon days. There's always birth, and there's always death. A barber's pole of perpetuity a shepherd's tone of eternity, a never-ending cycle of Black Fridays and sofa sales, and it'll roll round again fast enough, and always sooner than we expect. And I for one can't wait. In the haze of rolling news and digital hysteria, the brutality of nature reminds us we're still human, fragile and tiny creatures in a vast, uncaring world but free to move around in its infrastructure and take in its wonder and beauty, every nook and cranny, 
Every open space, every wide expanse, and every wild place. And so I keep on walking, in the hope of finding something better, something beautiful, something new. And so I keep on walking.